Hi, I am really happy to have Jeffrey Jerome Cohen and Julian Yates with me today. They are leading scholars in medieval and early modern studies, and they have a fascinating project in the works on modern interpretations of Noah's Ark. So this comes from a conversation that Julian and I have been having for a while about the ways in which the past is always with us and very often the narratives that we tell and can't stop ourselves from telling are haunted by long histories that are complicated and forgotten at our own peril. Another way of thinking about this is that it seems to us that during these times of eco-catastrophe, when rising seawaters are something that we're forced to think about all of the time, when climate justice is something that if we don't think about, well, we do so at our own peril and the peril of the lives of innocent people everywhere. If we don't start to think through what refuge really means in this moment of catastrophe, uh, then we will be losing an important opportunity to build the future that we want. Everybody thinks they know the story of Genesis and Noah's right. Ark, but as Julian and I have found repeatedly, as it turns out, the story in Genesis is complicated and elliptical and wants to be retold in ways that keep it alive. The version most of us know is the happy children's version, rainbows and all the animals happy on the ark. And it's a tale of safety and perseverance and climate change that doesn't really wipe much out. But throughout history, really Noah's Ark was set forward into the future as a way of thinking about those who are left behind, survival at cost, what it means to be a living creature who's been archived and then released into the world for an origin that's already tainted from the moment it begins. And it's also a story about how things keep going wrong. We call it an anthology of beginnings, but it's also a story of, of are we begun yet? So this nervous sense of the future and futurity is haunted by things that were unmade by the beginning you've started on. It's a do-over. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the, the flood story is a, is a, is a literal do-over, Earth, Earth 2.0. One of the wonderful things about the, um, the Genesis story is that the story of the flood embeds uh, a design problem, build the an ark. Um, and no matter where you're situated in a timeline from Genesis to now, um, if you're going to, to build an ark, you have to go back and read Genesis. So there's, a, there's an amazing continuity that gets generated out of traveling the past to the present in the company of a, a sort of an extended community of readers and rereaders of Genesis and Genesis commentary. There are a series of images that, that haunt us. One is the pencil and ink drawing by uh, Nathan Altman, a Russian Jewish um, artist. Uh, this is from 1933. And the ark is disappearing off on its way. And there's a small outcrop of, of shrinking land in the foreground with a dog on it, the melancholy dog. And it's that experience of having been left behind. And to the left of the dog is a tree or what you think is a tree. And then when you start to look more closely, it turns out to be birds, ravens, crows, seven of them. Meanwhile, when you look at the surface of the canvas, the rain sort of screams across it. It's a sort of amazing sense of having been left behind. Um, a sort of similar one would be one miniature in a series of originally, I think, over 90 of which 30 survive by William de Brailles. There is no arc at all in this image. Um, it's, it's gilt uh, and aquamarine, and that is all you see, and it's a um, submarine view of uh, what literally is outside the arc. The arc is nowhere to be seen. You can fantasize, I suppose, that we are on it and we have been saved and landfall has been made, but that's not the moment that actually gets depicted. Instead, the entire uh, image and the entire underwater landscape is filled with bodies, bodies of pigs, dogs, cats, birds, humans, all their faces preserved. And they are what appears to be asleep, or sleeping, preserved in that particular moment. And um, if, I mean, for me, what, what's strange about it is that if, if I want to supply text for it, where I end up going is Alonzo 
offering to jump into the um, the sea to follow Ferdinand into the ooze and be bedded in the ooze. And there's something compensatory about this image, but it's almost as though de Brailles in, sort of intuits that the sea remembers. Water has a kind of memory to it, and it's a repository. Uh, it's something still to think with. And you know, given the way in which you can roll that, that sort of image forward and we end up uh, in a conversation about um, people who, given particular circumstances, say as part of the um, uh, of slavery, end up choosing to jump into the water rather than remain within a slave ship, or the way in which sort of the effects of climate change, be they in terms of uh, global sea level rise or um, the um, or sort of access to clean, breathable air, is unevenly distributed across the globe, then it sort of clues us into the sort of the way in which some of these images and to sort of dilate and think upon and inhabit the story actually can be a sort of suggest modes of identification with a world that is suspended. Every image that Julian just described is not attested to in the biblical narrative. One of the things that really took us back is that whether it's described within supplementary narratives or within images, the stance of most artists is to be excluded from the ark, to find what it looks like on the sea bottom or to find what it looks like to be left behind. But Nate Notman is a great one. He's writing at a time when Jews have just lost their citizenship in Germany and the first concentration camps are opening and there's an ark sailing away on an island. It's telling a political story, but it's also telling a story of not being chosen, being left behind, being you know, forced into catastrophe. The very right. first illustrated Bible that we have, the Vienna Genesis, depicts the ark from the outside, from the point of view of the drowned as they cling to rocks and the pyramid shaped ark just floats away. And that is really fascinating to us, right? That the artists in general stand with the drowned, not with the saved, and that salvation always comes at cost. So one of the things that we're trying to think through and in order to make the arc maybe a better story than it has been for surviving ecological catastrophe is to think through with a little more rigor and a little more humanity what the price of admission to an arc is, who right. gets left behind, how refuge might be opened more opened widely uh, rather than be so narrowed or constrained figure. Wow, well, that's really beautiful. I want to thank both of you for sharing your thoughts about this project. And we're very excited to host you at UCI for our C-Sense conference at the end of April. <laughs>